Welcome to a show about learning technologies so powerful they transcend the boundaries of reality itself. I'm your host, Pinky Gonzalez, and this is New School VR. Hey everybody, welcome back to New School VR. This is Pinky Gonzalez, and today's show is unlike any show we've done before. As regular listeners know, this is almost always an interview format show, and we've had the great privilege to sit down with uh, founders of VR companies, educators, uh, psychologists, and, and other leaders in the field. Uh, but today I wanted to do a show based on a series of presentations that I've had the opportunity to give here in Portland, Oregon, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, one was for an EdTech meetup where we talked specifically about what's happening in VR and AR-assisted learning. Uh, which is exactly what this entire show is all about. And then another one was for a group of independent filmmakers who are just beginning to explore the concept of 360 video and what, what are the options out there and considerations. Um, I thought I would combine those two things today and give sort of a primer. Really, I almost feel like I should have started with this, but uh, I'm at least happy that we've had a chance to kind of work out some of the, the kinks and uh, get over the... Uh, the anxiety of just starting a podcast. It's, it's funny how much goes into it. But uh, So this is uh, not only unique in that it's just me, you're stuck with me this time, but it's also unique in that there's a visual component to this. So uh, I'm going to do my best to verbalize what I'm seeing on screen, but I'm also going to make this presentation available on YouTube and on SlideShare. Uh, please feel free to share it and, uh, and check it out there. I think some of these visuals will really be helpful. Um, but hopefully you can you can have it both ways. So uh, so let's get into it. So uh, for starters, this is just a 101 guide. If you are a super duper expert, uh, this might be super duper boring. <laughs> I hope not. I hope there's some some gem in there for everybody. But there are a lot of uh, of educators in particular that I've had a chance to connect with on Twitter and elsewhere um, that have asked some just really great but simple fundamental questions and so it would seem obvious to me that uh, that there's the, there's an opportunity to sort of start at square one and make sure that we're all on the same page so with that uh, I also haven't talked a lot about who I am, Pinky Gonzalez, P-I-N-K-Y. I got that goofy nickname working in the music business uh, for a lot of years out, out of uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, I don't do that anymore, but I am stuck with the nickname. So that really is what my wife and everyone else calls me. <laughs> uh, by day, I work at Dot Dot Dash. Uh, they are a sponsor of the New School VR podcast. We are a uh, production studio. We work on uh, custom VR creations. We do LED light control and robotics and uh, and all kinds of crazy whiz bang events. Um, typically, that's that's known as experiential marketing, and we put on these experiences for influential types, for brands like Adidas and Mountain Dew and a bunch of others. So I, I get to be in a business development uh, role for them, and obviously I do the New School VR podcast as well. So it's not a, a money making endeavor; uh, it's more a, a labor of love, something I really enjoy doing. And uh, as we speak, as I speak, I'm uh, here at Concordia University, and they have been very gracious uh, to donate studio uh, space, and uh, they've been a great uh, co-promoter co of the show, and I'm really proud to be associated with them. So that's me. Um, you can find me on Twitter at the handle, Pinky Gonzalez, all one word, or at New School VR. Okay, let's get into it. Uh, this could be you. <laughs> there's, there's no reason anybody can't do exactly what I'm doing now. So wherever you find yourself in this space, uh, just just get started. However you want to, however you want to start, just start. Um, speaking of starting, let's let's uh, get on with some of the, these definitions. So a, a little while ago, I posted on Reddit, "Hey, what's the difference between VR, AR, and MR?" And we covered this in the second show with uh, with Paul Reynolds, formerly of Magic Leap, and uh, now starting some new great things here in Portland. Uh, and it's funny, it, it actually is a surprisingly difficult question to answer, even though there is a surprisingly simple answer. So uh, just to make it obvious, VR, virtual reality, means entirely computer recreated. It's a 100% it's a simulation. There's nothing real about it. AR, augmented reality, uh, historically has been, at least in, in the last 10 years or so, has essentially meant using your phone or a tablet 
uh, which has its camera activated so you can see the live camera feed. And then there are other images superimposed on top. And the most famous example of this so far is Pokemon Go. That's all, that is the example you'll hear anytime somebody's talking about this. We call that augmented reality because it's this merging of uh, the physical or the real world and these digital elements. Well, MR, mixed reality, is actually not a new term at all, although a lot of people think it is. Uh, the term was coined in 94, at least, if it wasn't being used before. And MR, mixed reality, essentially is all of it. You can refer to mixed reality and be talking about VR or AR or both. But where it's really gained popularity, speaking of Magic Leap, is in this concept of a head-mounted display. It's another term you hear a lot, HMD, head-mounted display, where you, you're you seeing images that, that appear to be holographic. They actually have three-dimensional uh, characteristics. You can walk up to them, you can walk around them, and they react just the way uh, an object would. So we needed something that went beyond what we were referring to with the tablet, and that's why the term mixed reality is used a lot. Um, the, another great example would be HoloLens, or there's a company called Meta2, and others. There's a whole, a whole generation of companies that have these glasses, basically, or goggles that you, uh, that you put on, and, and instead of it activating a camera, you just see right through glass, and then these, these images are superimposed on that. So that's what we're referring to when it comes to mixed reality. Um, a, a, another important distinction is with 360 video, there's a lot of uh, debate about whether or not that is VR. And the snooty among us would say no. Um, I kind of, for me, it kind of depends. So there's really three different kinds of 360 video. 360 video. One is uh, 2D 360, meaning both eyes see exactly the same thing. There's not a 3D effect, but you can look around. So it is 360, live action usually, but it, all could, it could also be animated. Um, it's a 360 video that is two-dimensional. Next would be a 360 video that is three-dimensional. And what that means is that there, each eye sees a slightly different uh, angle on the scene, and so you get a 3D effect, and it's very immersive. It, it's very much like being there, and, uh, and I think you're getting into something more like VR in that space. The third level of VR video, true VR video, is uh, <laughs> it, the technology is here. It's still uh, ultra mega expensive and uh, takes some crazy processing power to pull off. <laughs> um, but so did uh, Pixar style animation for a lot of years. And, uh, and now, it's, now it's the standard. So uh, what this is, uh, this is a, it's an array of cameras. There are 14 red cameras. Red is a company known for being the elite camera making company. And in addition, there is a LiDAR sensor. And what LiDAR does is it captures actual light fields, meaning <laughs> uh, you can actually change the focus, the perspective, and the angle of what is being filmed after the fact. I don't even understand how it works. I just know that's how it works. So uh, this company, uh, they, they are called Hype VR. They are the makers of this rig, this rack that all these, these uh, cameras and sensors go into. They teamed up with Intel and made a huge splash at uh, CES this year, the Consumer Electronics Show. And uh, using an Oculus Rift, all of the reporters and VIPs there in, in attendance got to see what this thing is capable of firsthand. Um, the real difference, and like the this is the holy grail, is that not only is it 3D, 360, it is a space you can physically move around in. So it's live action film that you can interact with, um, or at least walk around in. Um, you still have limitations, but you know you can stand up and sit down and see the world in different angles. Um, you can see ripples on the water or a cow walking across the field and be physically in that space. It's absolutely crazy. Um, their demo was about 30 seconds long. I'm sure it took about six months to render. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so that nobody's going to be uh, running out to grab one of these suckers uh, in, in the next week or two. But, um, but at least as a proof of concept, um, it's, it's here. It's absolutely incredible stuff. And I can't wait to see uh, how, this, how this technology is commercialized. So next, let's talk about the difference uh, in hardware 
uh, hardware between these different things. So HMD, head mounted display. Right now we have the, the leaders in the field, the best in class are the HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift, and the PlayStation VR, PSVR is how it's referred to. Uh, in all three of these cases, you have these headsets that connect to a computer. In the case of PlayStation, it's obviously connecting to the PlayStation console, but it's a really important distinction because the power required to produce the best-in-class experiences is extreme. Uh, these systems are high-end gaming devices, and you need a high-end machine to power them. So the the good news is the experience is crazy awesome, and all things considered, um, they're not that expensive. But the bad news is it is an investment. So uh, to have a, a computer that is capable of uh, delivering a, a high-end performance, you're easily starting at $1,500, probably closer to $2,000. Um, they all run on Windows 10. It's Mac has not at all kept up in this space, so you cannot use Apple products for this at the moment. Um, and in the in the case of uh, PlayStation, and soon Microsoft will be releasing some some uh, VR stuff for the Xbox. Um, in all all of these cases, you need to plug it into a system that has uh, has a little more beef. Um, the headsets themselves, right now, the, the prices are fluctuating. I think the low end, uh, I think the, the PlayStation right now is at about $400. Uh, the Rift is at about $600, and the Vive is at about $800. Depending on when you're listening to this, that may have changed, but that's kind of where we're at in this space. So, essentially, you're looking at something around $2,500 in order to be uh, really at the top of the game. The next class, um, which is a major step down in a lot of ways, but there's way more content for it, these are mobile phone-based experiences. Um, Samsung really has been leading the way here with what's called the Gear VR, and it requires a Samsung phone, as you might expect, and these are their flagship phones. The, the, the highest-end Samsung phones are the ones that are going to work best uh, with this. The, the HMD that you put the phone into is a really important piece of the equation. There's some additional hardware in there that allows it to uh, sort of get yet another boost in, in power and performance. So it's, it's going to be extra sensitive in knowing where your head is tilting and uh, whether you're, you're moving or not. Um, and then uh, in a similar class is the Google Daydream, uh, which was just announced a few months ago here. Um, it also uses your, in this case, Google phone. Uh, there is a, there's a whole um, there's a whole series of phones now coming out that are Daydream compatible. Um, again, you put it into a headset, but this headset is it's just soft. There's there's no extra hardware. You're really just looking at your phone. But the distinction is it has a hand controller. So a hand controller that connects to your mobile phone-based VR experience is a huge positive step in the right direction. It allows us to physically see our hands. It allows us to navigate around a scene to point and click. Um, one of the basic constructs of movement in VR is what they call teleporting, where you can point at something and uh, magically appear uh, in that spot. And you really need a hand controller in order to uh, to accomplish that task. The first generation of the Gear VRs did not have that. It, it had a a touchpad on the the HMD itself, but there wasn't a, a secondary controller. Thankfully, now there is. Um, and what really led so much of this modern era of of VR innovation, uh, again thanks to Google, is what's known as cardboard. And you see this a lot. Uh, the educators out there will will be familiar with this concept of the Google cardboard viewers. They're extremely inexpensive. In a lot of cases, you can get them for free or a buck a piece. Um, they have plastic lenses instead of uh, glass or other high-end optics. There's no extra hardware. Um, it's literally made out of cardboard in a lot of in a lot of cases. And it, this was more or less a proof of concept. It, it came out of the uh, the twenty percent time at Google, which is sort of a famous um, employee, almost like a perk, where um, as long as you're getting the rest of your work done, they they allow you to work on special projects. Uh, 20% of your time, theoretically, and a lot of really interesting things have come out of that, um, Google Cardboard being one. So this was a couple of engineers there that just had this idea, like, you know, why not split your mobile screen in two, and then you can have these 3D video effects, and let's see if we can pull it off. And sure enough, they did. And there was enough interest 
that it's really sparked um, general awareness and um, much more opportunity in the industry at all levels of the hardware scale. So, uh, so we have Google Cardboard to thank for that. It's also kind of an outdated technology, though. So it's um, it's functional, but we're we're getting beyond the bare minimum now in the space, and the costs are coming down for what's beyond the bare minimum, and that's good. Um, as of right now, there's about 10 million cardboard devices in the space. There are 5 million uh, Gear VR headsets out there. There are 1 million uh, Sony PlayStation VR headsets. So the total universe right now is still, you know, 15 to 20 million. Um, but that's growing extremely fast. This time last year, it was, you know, a lot less. <laughs> I don't know what the number is, but uh, it's moving very, very fast. And and uh, it's it's funny to be an early adopter in this space because you can just see it coming. You can really feel the potential and there's frustration that it's not happening faster, but in the grand scheme of things, it's happening extremely fast. So uh, let's move along. When it, when it comes to using these technologies for education, there are some very important considerations. Um, I've broken this down into four main uh, main points to keep in mind. One is the age of the user. There is some debate over if if it's even healthy for a kid to use this stuff. Uh, it's worth noting that there's literally no research to point to anybody having any physical uh, uh, problems with this stuff. There's 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 no evidence saying this is bad, but there's enough concern that uh, there's a camp out there who, who believes that nobody under 13 should even put one of these things on. Our eyeballs are still developing uh, when we're young, and uh, it could be harmful. Um, so until there is any actual evidence of that, I'm going to err on the side of just keep it in reason. <laughs> Maybe don't let your kid uh, s stay in a VR headset for four hours at a time. Um, and particularly with a, in a classroom setting, it's not reasonable that the kids would have these on the entire class time anyway. So, um, but you know, the younger they are, the 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 more a consideration that is. Another factor is just emotional maturity at that point. I think this one is is much more important. Um, in in the great interview we had with CoSpaces, um, we talked about um, things like the Holocaust. I mean, we, we could be telling stories that are absolutely horrifying that you know things that really happened that were horrifying that are just like you know a movie you know you've got a g rating pg pg 13 r and beyond and uh not all content is appropriate for all ages so the age of the participant is really critical second is the grade um this is uh sort of a class of uh experience i guess that we're um you're going to have levels of content not just um, you know, for nine-year-olds, but for somebody going through school that, are, that is expected to have a certain level of competency before they're allowed to go on to grade four, um, we have grade-specific content. So age and grade are obviously closely related, but they are separate uh, separate components. One, one is more of a concern or consideration, and the other is more about um, aptitude and progress. Um, next, we have the subject matter. So obviously, we've got you know math and science and social studies and all all the greats, and uh, there's VR content for all of those things. So um, as an educator, it's important to be looking for things that are going to be uh, suitable for the actual subject. But what we're also finding, and much to my delight, is that there are some unexpected and unexpectedly great tools that are helping uh, in in subjects that we may not have have expected. And my favorite example is uh, Tilt Brush, Google's three, 3D painting program. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's totally best in class in terms of uh, things to make art with. Um, and there's a great video on YouTube of a guy using it essentially like a whiteboard. It's not running any calculations. It's not supporting the, the mathematics part of what this guy's learning. He's, he's actually doing these calculus um, equations, and he's sharing his screen with his professor who can see what he's doing, and they have this long dialogue. It's a, over an hour long. Um, it's just it's a, it's a tool to be able to write numbers in the sky, uh, there's no reason you couldn't do that with text. Um, and it, what I find so surprising about it is what a great tool it is for math, and yet it has nothing to do with a calculator. So um, those are just considerations. We can, we can recreate experiences or we can produce things that would not be possible in real life. And um, I, I get a little frustrated when we default to things that are just a virtual uh, or artificial version of what we can already do in real life. Like, 
why? Why would we do that? <laughs> we already have that. That you know, if if you have the means to go to a museum uh, down the street, you should do that. That you know, just because we can recreate that museum in VR doesn't mean we shouldn't go experience the museum in real life. So, um, I I'm definitely one to uh, kind of <laughs> geek out on the on the unexpected or the uh, the experiences beyond real life that we would not otherwise be able to have. So. I'll get off my soapbox there. But um, and then finally, the situation that they're in. So if I am uh, if I'm in a classroom, then I'm going to have one kind of experience. The the um, the field trip is one of the most common. We'll talk a little bit about um, experience types here in just a little bit. But um, if I'm in a classroom, it's reasonable that I would put on a headset, see uh, the pyramids or whatever we're there as a class visiting, take it off, and then have a discussion about it. If I'm learning at home, um, whether this is a you know professional development, whether it's something I'm just interested in in seeing or exploring from the comfort of my own home, uh, the situation itself really is is part of um, what dictates the best kind of content. How much time do I have? Um, how much you know? Just space. How how much? How how deep can I go with this stuff? Is it facilitated or is it not? So age, grade, subject, situation. Those are kind of the the core. The, the pillars uh, of considerations in the learning space. Next up, uh, there are what I see as four basic experience types. Um, one is passive viewing. Um, so this would be like your field trip experience. Um, you're just there. <laughs> uh, this is definitely the case with 360 video. It's not about interactivity outside of being able to turn your head and look up and down. It's more about uh, listening and watching. So I'm just passively there. Um, the next form is uh, what I call object observations. Very, very common. Uh, you see it's just a virtual item that you can pick up and look at. <laughs> so this is kind of like interactivity 101. Um, you know, you, maybe it's a skeleton or something. You can, you can grab the guy's hand and, and uh, pull it up or, you know, turn their head or whatever. It's, it's just this idea of... Uh, interacting with a virtual object. Um, the object may not do anything other than allow you to pick it up or throw it. Um, and then obviously if it's a, you know, if you've got guns and that kind of stuff, it's another level of, of uh, interaction. But this basic concept of just observation, I can pick up a planet, I can look at the stars, I can be in the space. Um, next, and where we really get uh, into the good stuff, as far as I'm concerned, are with uh, creation tools. If I'm actually making something, my brain is activated in a way that it is not going to be without that. Um, even with a great imagination, listening to a story being told, there's just no comparison between the, the level of uh, memory recall um, the, and uh, depth of understanding when we're creating something around a topic we are learning uh, at a, in a profound and, and fundamentally different way. So my personal favorite tools are the ones that allow us to physically create and express. Um, uh, maybe it is a, a story. CoSpaces is a, another great example with this, um, where you know you might you might use this in a an English class where you're reading a, about Romeo and Juliet. The idea is using a uh, standard desktop computer or a laptop. You can create these three D environments. So it might be a a building with a balcony and Juliet is up on the balcony and Romeo is down below on bended knee. Um, just creating that scene, even if it's not animated, which it can be, um, but not really the point, even if it's not animated, just creating the scene, physically interacting with the characters and being able to put on a headset and and be there to to become a part of your creation is an extremely powerful experience. Um, Minecraft is now capable of this, and kids freak out about it. It is so cool to make something in one uh, in one area on your desktop, and then to experience it in another in virtual space. So, um, creation tools are extremely powerful and something I want to see a lot more of in this space. And then finally, simulations. Uh, the last show we just did with uh, Industrial Training International, ITI, um, they specialize in f actual training of real heavy construction equipment, cranes and trucks and that kind of stuff um, with true-to-life controllers and true-to-life physics. And just as a professional pilot uh, is required to, to have a certain amount of uh, hours in flight simulators every year in order to maintain their, their licensing, 
Um, we can now do this in all forms of industry. So VR simulations, they're so powerful. They're not only are they immersive, um, but they're you're, you really are learning to do something that you can then apply in the real world. Um, we also saw a version of this with um, one of our early shows with a company called Mersion, where they have, uh, it's almost like VR puppetry. There's a, a live uh, actor who is behind these virtual characters and they're teaching, um, they're teaching people. Uh, in one case, they're, uh, they're working with school teachers and uh, helping them improve on their classroom technique, um, dealing with parents and challenging situations. Um, in other cases, they, they did a major uh, program with Best Western Hotels, uh, so it's training the front counter staff to deal with uh, with issues that guests often encounter, whether it's you know trouble with their room or noise or whatever. Um, so this is it is a simulation; it's a recreation of something they're going to experience in real life. But doing that in VR both gives us extra tools we didn't have, like the ability to crash a crane, <laughs> which you, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to experience in real life, um, or uh, just, you know, other challenging situations, dealing with with problem kids and parents and teachers. Um, those are those are difficult to learn about without actually practicing and doing it. And so uh, through these virtual technologies, we're now able to recreate those experiences, um, even when we have a human element in there. There's a dynamic that that the virtual world um, provides. It's really powerful stuff. So, uh, so again, to recap, passive viewing experiences, object observations, creation tools, and simulations. Next, we have popular subjects. So we've been talking about a few of them here. Obviously, field trips keeps coming up. This idea of uh, being able to take either an individual or an entire class or group of people simultaneously to a place, usually 360 video, and experience it together. Um, whether that's a very short experience or indefinitely long, um, the just the concept of the field trip going somewhere um, is the idea. Next, we have uh, physiology. There's a lot of VR experiences around uh, the muscles and bones and blood cells and this sort of stuff. So that the the medical sciences, um, biology, and and that whole category. There's some really neat experiences out there. Astronomy is a great one, probably one of the best ones. Um, we we think we understand things as human beings that we really don't. And very big and very small are things we think we have a grasp on and generally do not. Uh, once something gets to be really, really, really big, they're all just sort of really, really, really big. So uh, what's great about the scale and um, the infinite nature of VR is that we can we can see big and small in in very tangible ways, ways that a an illustration in a textbook just aren't going to get our brain to care about. Um, so to become the size of a, you know, a, a star, a, a sun, a planet, um, and to be able to, uh, to see these things visualized, um, it just brings a, a different scale and dimension that um, you, you just don't get any other way. There's no, even watching a film, you just don't get it without being there at scale. It's really powerful stuff. Um, life sciences, we were actually kind of covering that uh, just a minute ago in terms of uh, biology, but it goes even into you know plants and animals and um, nature itself. Um, uh, all, all of the wonderful intricacies, um, those are all uh, all on the table. We can, we can teach through storytelling. We can teach through examples. We can teach through these virtual simulations and illustrations. Um, life sciences is a big and important subject. Uh, history comes up a lot, and I really love this one. There, there's a couple of different ways to go about it. Um, we heard about it in the very first show with Sean Daly of Concordia University. Uh, he was a history teacher for, for much of his career. And the idea of using AR in that traditional sense we talked about at the top of the show, literally just putting up a phone or a tablet, if you're in the middle of an empty field, it's just an empty field, even if something historical went down there, you know, whether it's a you know, Civil War battlefield or there, was, there used to be buildings or a town or whatever. Um, it's nice to be there, but it's so powerful to be there and have these visual aids where you can put, uh, put up a screen and suddenly it's, it's real life. Um, obviously, you could do, um, you, you can teach history using VR, it, whether it's 360 video, recreations, live action, animation. Uh, telling stories with this stuff, um, making it real, making it present, um, bringing these characters to life in a 
in a visceral way, uh, again, you're just your brain is going to respond so much more powerfully to something that it, it feels is real, it feels like is tangible, and um, and there's a true dynamic, a true interaction with than simply being told what you're supposed to memorize and uh, and trying to retain that. Uh, next, we have archaeology. Um, really, really great and actually very simple in the grand scheme of things. Um, we can recreate buildings in, in animated form, and we do. <laughs> so you see a lot, and, and there's sort of a hybrid here, archaeology, history, field trips. Um, you know, we can see the, the ruins in Rome in modern day and uh, see recreations of what it would have looked like back in the day. And so those are really useful tools to have. Um, and then finally, fine art and art history. Um, we see a lot of this. This is kind of that museum experience again, or the the uh, uh, object interaction. Um, this it, you, doesn't have to be animated. It doesn't have to be. Um, it, it doesn't have to have whistles and bells and explode and shoot stuff. Uh, you can just observe, and uh, art is a very observable form. So, uh, so we do see a lot of um, art experiences in VR, and it's a very useful uh, teaching tool. Uh, next, let's talk about popular apps, actual specific apps. I'm sure some of you have been anxious to get to this part the whole time. Uh, so among the most popular, uh, we have Google Earth. It, it's truly a best-in-class VR experience. Um, as of right now, it works on the HTC Vive and on uh, Google Daydream headsets. Soon it will be universally available, uh, literally and figuratively, and what what makes this so unique is that, as most of us know, Google has been taking satellite images for years now. They've covered the entire planet. And we have Street View, and in some cases, like uh, you know, major cities, San Francisco and Paris and others, um, they have full, full three-dimensional street-level tours of these cities. So they've taken all of that information and they've smooshed it into this VR experience and uh, added some, some very elegant navigation tools, again, using a hand controller, so you can just point and click to where you want to go. And they've, they've sort of given us the ability to see our planet the way only an astronaut, an astronaut could have before. Um, and again, being physically in space with the planet is very different than just seeing a video or an illustration. So... Um, being able to zoom in and out of the planet itself, being able to go, of course, all the way down to your your house is you know the, one of the first things anybody does, or their office, they want to see where they are. Um, but it it brings a sense of uh, almost reality that that we don't think about every day. That you know we talk about the the fragility of the planet. Well, it's hard to imagine when it just seems infinitely huge. But when you're able to step back and in. Um, it brings a, a whole different perspective to it. So Google Earth, I can't say enough good things about it. It's free. You just have to have um, a viewer capable of, of seeing it. Absolutely extraordinary. Uh, Co-spaces I've been talking about uh, religiously. I love what they're doing. This is in that creation uh, category. I can make something on my PC and then experience it in my headset. Um, you can find them at cospaces.io. Lifelike, uh, Martin was just recently on our show, and uh, Lifelike, uh, they're one of these object observation style things. They have thousands of three-dimensional objects, uh, primarily based on life sciences, um, and you can have these experiences. You can see it, you can explore it, you can interact with it. Um, and they're now an official partner with HTC Vive, so they're they're producing new content on the daily, and uh, it's really neat stuff. They, they spell it wrong, though. It's L-I-F-E. L-I-Q-U-E, lifelike. Uh, next, we have Unimersive, also uh, have been on the show, and they are a VR uh, field trip style experience. It's all animated, so it's not 360 video. It is, um, these are uh, uh, 3D animations, but they, they cover educational topics. So um, being on the International Space Station and uh, being in Rome and Athens and these different places. It's a great teaching utility. Um, they're really beautiful designs, and they work on Gear VR and o Oculus Rift currently. Um, the Body VR, this is in that um, biology uh, end of things. This is phenomenal. It's a, it's a story, well, it's like a story-driven narrative. There's a great narration track that, it, that explains what's going on. You are the size of a blood cell. Uh, floating around inside of a body, 
and to see how um, how neurons and uh, the, all, just all the <laughs> the complexity of the human body is mind bending, and this is a wonderful way to really bring those elements together and see it happen right in front of your eyes. So uh, it's another one that's fully um, uh, animated. It's not video. It would be very difficult to get video at that at that scale in 3D. Um, so they, But they've just done a wonderful job with it. It's absolutely beautiful and uh, highly informative. So that's called The Body VR. Um, uh, one of the, well, I would say the best-in-class space programs right now, if you want to get into the astronomy side of things, it's called Universe Sandbox. Um, or Universe Sandbox Squared, this little two after Sandbox. Um, holy moly, not only is it um, uh, at, at scale, I mean, you know, all the planets are correctly sized and rotating in the right direction and so forth, but they have these animations that also show how, how our solar system uh, interacts with the universe at large, um, that we are all part of this dynamic system is just a crazy thing to wrap your head around. Um, the animations are extraordinary and um, highly informative. So if you're interested in the space side of things, Universe Sandbox, I think it sells for about 20 bucks, um, and I believe it's available for Vive and for Oculus. Uh, Z-Space is another really good one. Um, th this is uh, basically straight classroom style hardware. In fact, I probably should have talked about this uh, earlier, but um, there, it's not a head, well, <laughs> how do I say it? They have a 3D experience that requires special hardware, so a special monitor, and you see it pop out from the screen using glasses, and they're just polarized glasses. They're, they're in, you know, they're specialty glasses, but um, it creates this 3D effect, and um, they've produced full lesson plans, um, it's a really neat company. They're they're passionate educators. It's a form of VR. It's uh, often referred to as uh, fish tank VR, wherein you you see inside of the screen in uh, in a three dimensional way, but it's not a head mounted display where you're going to be able to look all around. Um, it's a it's an interesting business model. We'll see if they if they stick to the screen based thing, but um, some great content in there anyway. So it's Z Space. Um, and then finally, we have a whole generation of content coming out from uh, from journalists and, and broadcasting companies, the BBC, Discovery, National Geographic, um, USA Today, CNN just announced a, a whole new um, division, 360 video um, reporting. So it's, it, it's this constant chicken or the egg. We're going to have more headsets out there when there's more content people want to experience. And there's going to be more content produced when there's more people that have the ability to see it. <laughs> and so it's great. It's great to see uh, so much content being produced now. It's just all the more reason why somebody ultimately will get a headset. Okay, let's talk about cameras. If you're interested in getting started in this space and you're not an animator and you don't want to be, um, where do you get started? How, what is this going to cost and how do we, how do we take that first step? The good news is for under $200, you can be producing 360 video. Um, you can imagine there's a whole spectrum of equipment out there and you can spend as much as you as you want. <laughs> but uh, as starting at about $150, your options get pretty, pretty solid. Uh, for $250, Samsung makes what's kind of the best in class consumer grade 360 camera. It's called the Samsung Gear 360. Um, it is uh, very highly rated, very high quality. It'll, it's, it's just point and shoot. You can shoot anything you want in 360. It comes with a video editor. It's also going to work with uh, standard video editing programs, um, which we'll cover specifically here in just a second. But um, it, it doesn't take a lot. If you're serious about it um, and you got a couple of hundred bucks, you can be in the ball game. If you're really serious about it, if you're, if you're professional grade, um, there are some extremely uh, impressive <laughs> cameras out there now at relatively, well, I'll just say very reasonable cost. So starting at about $5,000, the GoPro Omni is really kind of best in class. Um, it's got six GoPro cameras uh, in this mount, and each one has a special lens, so it creates this 360 field. Um, it comes with some excellent editing software, and this is, and you can shoot professional grade stuff with it. So, if you're serious enough, or if you're, uh, you know, making money on this stuff, or producing commercials, or uh, real estate 
uh, tours, um, in any sort of um, business application, this is really um, where you want to start. So five grand, that's all in, all your cameras, the mount, the software, all the stuff. Um, GoPro also has a, a, a bigger version. Uh, it's called the Odyssey. It has 16 cameras, and that goes for about $15,000. Um, still a good deal by, by relative standards, but you're probably going to get what you need from the Omni. Uh, more more likely than not, and then finally, if you're if you're big time, you're shooting feature films. Uh, the the Cadillac of the space is called the Nokia Ozo, and right now it's going for about forty five thousand. Um, but to put it in perspective, this this actual camera, this actual technology, just a year a year or so ago, was about twice as expensive. So costs are coming way 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 down. And, uh, and the quality just continues to go up. So um, it's, it's nice to be on the receiving end of <laughs> that, that process, for sure. Um, another really important point, a uh, good, good friend of mine brought this to my attention, is that the cameras themselves are obviously a, a really important ingredient, very, very important. Um, but one of the main differentiators is the, the, the software, the brains behind them, the way they stitch the various camera angles together is really one of the big uh, differentiators. And with Ozo, the way they process the images so that it can be edited in a fluid and, and intuitive way, that's really what makes it stand out uh, amongst the rest. It's, it's just the best visual optics you can get. Um, you just need $45,000 to get there. <laughs> and then finally, uh, the, the, if you've got crazy money and, and just looking to burn it, um, there is an insane rig out now called the Hype VR, and uh, they debuted at CES. This is what I was referring to earlier that um, Intel made a big splash with. Um, this sucker, it's got 14 red cameras, and for those in the industry, red is, is uh, again, best in class, most expensive, you know, the latest, greatest, most, most awesome. So this rig has 14 red cameras, um, and a LiDAR sensor. So when we were talking about this like true VR video, LiDAR is combining with all of this image capture to create a volumetric video space so that the viewer can physically be there. They can stand up, they can sit down. Um, it's not just a passive viewing experience. You really can be in the scene. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um, they actually haven't even released a price on this thing, but it, it's looking like probably half a million bucks or so. So knock yourself out if you've got the means. Uh, actual editors, just to list some specific ones, um, Adobe Premiere, Final Cut Pro, GoPro Studio, Vegas Pro. Um, these are all very commonly used video editors, um, all very reasonably priced. So if you're going to drop a couple hundred bucks on a camera, you might as well look into some of these things. Um, personally, I use Adobe Premiere. Um, I just happen to use the, the suite of, uh, Adobe products even to, to produce the audio for this show. So, um, Anyway, Adobe Premiere, Final Cut, GoPro, Vegas, Google it. There's plenty of options out there. Um, some things to consider, some of the challenges we hear a lot about in, in this space. Um, it's still early days. That's good and bad. It's good in that we can be experimental and um, many of the rules are yet to be written. It's bad because sometimes uh, your story sucks <laughs> because your technology gets in the way. Um, it's, it's not uncommon for something that, you know, is, is meant to expand our horizons and our abilities actually ends up being a total distraction and, uh, an unnecessary one. So, um, <laughs> with that said, some of the things to keep in mind, um, directors really love to tell the viewer what to see. That's kind of the whole point, the frame. What do you see? Um, how do we cut from one scene to another? Um, th there's no distraction around you. Well, if you're shooting in 360, the question constantly comes up, well, how, how does the viewer know where to look? Well, uh, a little bit of common sense goes a long way in this one. Um, you can be looking around the room in any conversation. You just choose not to. <laughs> um, just because you can doesn't mean it's going to be interesting to do that. So as long as there's not something distracting going on somewhere else, you know, a rat running around the room while you're trying to pay attention to this, uh, this conversation, it's really a non-issue. 
Um, but it is a different medium. So keeping the viewer's, att viewer's attention, um, we can do this through, uh, obviously, the scene itself, wh what's moving. We can do this with audio, where's the sound coming from. And if we need to divert the person's attention or call their attention from, say, a conversation straight in front of us to uh, somebody coming through the door, we might do that with audio. The, the sound of a knock is, is plenty to, uh, uh, to catch your attention and, and get you to focus. Um, lighting is a real challenge. This is really big for two reasons. One, uh, when you have a limited frame of reference, you just light that. <laughs> and, uh, and now we have more frame to have to light. But the other is the physical lights themselves. How, they're going to be seen if, if they're not, <laughs> if it's not natural light, you have real challenges around, um, what appears in the scene. And so that is a tricky one. For sure, I don't know when or if that problem is ever going to be solved. Um, same with multiple camera angles. You, you might have the choice to be able to sit anywhere you want in a room as part of a story. Well, there's going to be a camera everywhere you get to sit. So can you see those cameras? Um, are we able to mask them or take them out digitally? Um, again, tricky stuff. It's uh, There's not a correct way to do it just yet, but those are things that are going to come up. Um, speaking of navigation, should I be able to wander around in the room? Um, not necessarily. It's a, it's an option. But if I am allowed to do that, then how do I do it? Um, then that's where we get into specific um, hardware capabilities. So if I've got a hand controller, I will likely be able to just point and click and do that teleport function. If I don't have a, tel a hand controller, like if I'm using Google Cardboard, the most common way is there's a little dot on the screen. And whatever you point that dot at, uh, for long enough, that's what tells the the device to take you to that different angle. And it's okay. It's a little clunky, but it's functional. Um, it also has a tendency to make people a little uh, woozy, <laughs> seasick. Uh, and to that point, that's a major consideration. One thing that is uh, very likely to induce uh, vomitous feelings <laughs> is motion. So if the camera itself is moving, you're going to have a bad time. <laughs> um, there are some basic tricks to uh, to limit the, the motion sickness problem. Um, one is to have something like, um, if you're in a vehicle, you want to see the, the cockpit or the dash still. You want you, It should stay still, even if um, you're seeing motion outside of the, the windshield, for example. And that's what tells your brain that you're stationary, even though you're moving, and that helps in processing what's going on. Um, another is, um, they, and they call this um, being on the rail, I think, this idea of seeing the track that you're going to be on. So roller coaster experiences can be fun. Um, part of what makes them work is that you can see where you're going to go. So your brain is adapting in real time to what this motion is supposed to be. But any sort of unexpected motion, uh, jittery uh, film, or uh, just things like anti-gravity, well, well, I don't even get sick very easily and that just turns my stomach thinking about it. Um, so yeah, but motion is a real challenge. You typically wanna stay put, get a tripod and leave it alone. <laughs> uh, and then finally, spatial audio. Um, as you record these things with a 360 camera, um, it's, it, it's reasonable that your sound would also be in 360, but you have to do that intentionally. and. Um, more and more, there are some great audio tools. So if you're on the professional scale, you're going to spend some dough on uh, spatial audio equipment as well. Um, but the cool thing about these other camera rigs is that they do have microphones dispersed throughout, and um, they are picking up a not just stereo left and right, but spatial, meaning entirely around, up, down, and otherwise. It's really neat stuff. Um, popular subjects for 360 video, as I mentioned, journalism is really driving the space. Um, field trips, another major common uh, useful construct. Uh, documentaries, they're, they're sort of in that, that pocket. Um, TV commercials and other, other marketing um, activations, kind of the, the area that, that uh, Dot Dot Dash uh, is in. These are, it's one of the ways to actually make a living doing this right now. It's a specialty deal. Um, same with real estate. They're, um, it's not it, 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 there, are, there aren't so many people that have the hardware that you're going to hit a huge, massive audience out of the gate. 
So the idea is if you have an audience that either has access to this or is going to be in a in a specific place so you know that they'll be able to experience this, then you have a great opportunity to use 360 video as uh, as a way to, to communicate. Um, so commercials in that marketing um, realm are, are developing. Um, and then finally, simulations. So um, not only can you do animated interactive gaming style simulations like ITI is doing with uh, with cranes, but you can also do um, live action simulations. Um, here at Concordia, they have a, um, a, a disaster response program, and they use a lot of live action video to put the, the student in, in the headspace. So, uh, so you can actually shoot 360 video as a, as a form of, um, of simulation as well. Um, here on the screen right now, that CNN just announced um, that they're going to start doing 360 video, um, just, just another in the, in the growing list. So, um, so really, I would say journalism, documentaries, storytelling, those are kind of the big ones. Um, and finally, this is the last, the last sec section for today. Um, why does it matter? <laughs> um, I've, I've got another buddy um, that it was, it was fun to see kind of the light bulb moment with him. He's, he's a longtime filmmaker and he's interested in this stuff, but hasn't, hasn't dove in just yet. And it was like, you know, why or where, where would I even put this if I, if I made it? Well, it's coming fast. Netflix is the short answer. Um, they now have a an app that you can see on Gear VR. It'll be available for all of the rest here shortly, and you can watch any Netflix anything in a virtual space. So this would be 2D content, traditional just TV shows, whatever you want to watch, but you happen to be in a virtual space. Well, the next generation of this stuff is going to be virtual films. So you'll be able to distribute native VR content through Netflix. Same with YouTube. You can already see 360 videos from your browser on YouTube. Now with, uh, with Daydream and soon, soon the rest, you'll be able to watch Google's 360 videos in a VR headset. And then the, the really big and important uh, breakthrough is what's called Web VR. Web VR is an open standard. It is universally accepted by the industry. All of the major players, Intel, Facebook, Google, whatever, Qualcomm, everybody is, is game. And uh, what it's going to allow us to do is to stream VR content through a web browser. Meaning, if you've got a VR headset on, you can surf the web. Traditional, everyday, you know, check your Gmail, whatever. But also, when you come across a VR experience, it, it will just play. You don't have to take your headset off. Um, so the, I like to describe this as um, just as we see images and video in a particular way on a, on a website, now we'll have a new form of media in VR. So with an image, you might see a little magnifying glass to tell you that you can click on it and make it go big. Uh, with the video, you might see the triangle to, to indicate that you're going to be able to play it. And there will be some iconography around uh, web VR. So um, it's obviously not so mainstream that we're all seeing this all of the time, but give it a couple of years. I think, so as of right now, it's 2017. I, I'm predicting, you know, by 2020, this stuff is going to be prime time. Um, another two years at least of um, the big companies duking it out, um, some of the best practices being well-defined, um, a few billion more in investment dollars coming into the industry, more experimentation, um, more business opportunity, more adoption in schools, um, more, more uh, just off-the-shelf mobile devices, not only capable of doing this stuff, but really that being a selling feature. Um, we're we're going to see generation after generation. And then the big hype is around what Apple is about to announce. And they, they have not yet announced it, but Tim Cook, the CEO, has been uh, not very secretive about his belief that augmented reality, meaning that first version, the first definition we started with, it's going to be ubiquitous. Um, the way he describes it is that it will, quote unquote, be as popular as the iPhone. And uh, it's just my personal guess, but I think he's actually saying it's going to be your iPhone. Um, and the, the way they will do that and why, ha, what that means, what it means that it will be and it isn't yet is this uh, spatial awareness. So your phone will have more than one camera on, on, the, on the backside. 
um, it will be able to see the world in three dimensions, and there will be a new layer of programming capability to go with that. So when you put your phone up in that empty field, <laughs> it's not just seeing the GPS coordinates, it's actually seeing blades of grass and, and will allow developers um, to superimpose three-dimensional images that, that you can walk up to and, and around. And that kind of functionality is, is really going to be a game changer. So we'll see what they actually come out with. But um, my prediction is that they're not going to start with glasses. They're going to start with um, a spatially aware phone. And then glasses would be a quote-unquote easy accessory after that. So we'll see. Anyway, thanks for listening. Um, if you guys haven't already subscribed, you should like get with the program, man. <laughs> um, I try and do these about every week. It's sometimes every couple of weeks. Um, I also try not to apologize when I don't because I hate it when podcasters do that. <laughs> um, but uh, we've got some great guests uh, scheduled to come up, and hopefully the show will will stay on the air indefinitely. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I always do a show recap at newschoolvr.com. Um, I frequently post um, not only show information, but industry news and, and relevant stuff for educators and ed tech enthusiasts uh, on Twitter. And you can follow me there either at New School VR or Pinky Gonzalez at Pinky Gonzalez. Thanks again. See you next time. New School VR is graciously supported by and recorded live at Concordia University in beautiful Portland, Oregon. For over 100 years, Concordia has been preparing teachers and learning professionals for life and for a living. For more information, visit cu-portland.edu. And by Dot Dot Dash, an experiential design and technology studio specializing in custom virtual reality and experiential marketing activations that incite wonder and inspire action. See more at dot dot dash dot io. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on iTunes or through your favorite podcast delivery app. Visit us online at newschoolvr.com. And thanks for listening. I'm your host, Pinky Gonzalez, and this is New School VR. This VR po podcast is dope.